As I lived my life, as I walked through my busy day, as I entered and exited conversations that made inherent assumptions about how the world works, I found myself with greater and greater frequency beginning to stop and take a moment to consider. How do I know what is real? Why do I believe what I believe? What am I justified to believe? About any situation, about any topic, about the very nature of reality itself, what am I justified to believe? This question is the core concern of a branch of philosophy called epistemology. In 1641, René Descartes attempted to answer this question in a philosophical treatise called Meditations on First Philosophy. He was probably not the first to attempt this, but he is one of the most famous. Descartes begins by presuming that he is not justified to believe anything. He purges himself of all his beliefs. He has multiple reasonable justifications for this first step. One is his observation that there are many opinions he once had when he was younger that he later modified or discarded with age and experience. Another is his observation that, while in a dream, the experience is often indistinguishable from reality. So how is it that he can know that he isn't just in a dream? From here, Descartes tries to justify something, anything, any of his former beliefs. His starting point is the existence of himself. By even questioning if he exists, he justifies belief in his existence. He remarks that, I am, I exist, is necessarily a true statement every time it is expressed. In later works, he would sum up this argument with the phrase, I think, therefore I am, or cogito ergo sum. Up to this point, my own conclusions match precisely with Descartes. While I couldn't justify the existence of my body, or even the existence of the minds of other people, I could at least justify the existence of my own mind by merely contemplating the question of my own existence. But after these first steps, my reasoning parts ways with Descartes in such profound and radical ways that, in order to make my own epistemological reasoning clear, it's probably better that I just express my own judgments and reference Descartes as a possible point of contrast when explaining my own perspective. So, like Descartes, I can reasonably infer that I exist. Now, how do I know that anything outside of myself exists? How do I know that I'm not just experiencing a dream? How do I know that I'm not just a brain in a vat experiencing a computer simulation? How do I know that I myself am not just a program in a computer simulation? The answer is, I don't. I don't know that anything I see or experience is actually real. I have to make a presupposition, an assumption. And that presupposition is, at least some of my perceptions, sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, are accurate, meaning they reflect reality. Not all of them are. I can recall based on experience that all of my senses have been mistaken sometimes. I've thought I saw things I didn't see, like a strange and creepy man who turned out to be a cardboard cutout. I've thought I heard things I didn't hear, like the blood-curdling scream of a woman being murdered that turned out to be the screeches of a bizarre species of owl. I've thought I touched things I didn't touch, like an insect crawling on my face that turned out to be one of my own hairs. But without the presupposition that at least some of my perceptions are accurate, I have nowhere to go epistemologically. Without this presupposition, it is game over. I may be wrong. I may actually be a brain in a vat experiencing simulated illusions, but I have no choice to at least initially assume that I am not just a brain in a vat if I want to go anywhere meaningful epistemologically. Presupposing that at least some of my perceptions are accurate, how do I make conclusions about reality? This brings me to my next set of presuppositions. I form beliefs about reality based on physical evidence. The more physical evidence I have for a belief, the more justified I am to believe it. The strength of my beliefs should be directly proportional to the amount of evidence I have for them. If I ever doubt the validity of a conclusion I make based on evidence, I can return to that evidence, re-examine it, and see if I come to the same conclusion. Unlike my previous presupposition, which was weak but necessary, this set of presuppositions has self-reinforcing properties 
they cause it to have some serious power epistemologically. In fact, unlike Descartes, I will argue that every justified belief that we have about reality is ultimately grounded in evidence. And conversely, that beliefs that are not grounded in evidence, and beliefs that are grounded in less evidence, are unjustified and more weakly justified, respectively. In fact, throughout my explanations, and throughout all of the explanations I have presented in my series so far, I have deferred to evidence-based reasoning to justify my claims. For example, in this video, I'll use visual images and evidential experiences that I presumably share with my viewers to demonstrate my points. In other words, even for the purpose of defending the use of evidence, I have to use evidence. The primacy of evidence to my belief justification process is that inextricable. Descartes makes the argument that some high-level rational beliefs are self-evident. For example, the proposition that 2 plus 3 equals 5 is, Descartes argues, self-evident. But I disagree. Rather, when pressed to do so, we can justify the belief that 2 plus 3 equals 5 using evidence. There are a few ways to do this, and here is one. Count out five items. Now place two items next to those. Then place three items next to those, and see if the two piles match. This justifies using visual evidence that 2 plus 3 equals 5. Now I suspect one reason why Descartes was so inclined to declare that 2 plus 3 equals 5 is self-evident was, unconsciously, due to social pressure. There are certain beliefs that are so commonly held by individuals in our society that even questioning them evokes ridicule. In fact, my own awareness of these social pressures made me uncomfortable with the idea of breaking down 2 plus 3 equals 5 into an evidentially based argument. These are beliefs that we are socially pressured to have, through both positive and negative social reinforcement. But the reality is, they are not self-evident. And people who say they are may be unconsciously succumbing to social pressure. It is important to remember that, while the emotional reactions of other human beings are relevant to navigating and nurturing our social climate, they have no bearing on the ultimate truth value or justification of a belief. But there's likely yet another reason that Descartes was inclined to declare 2 plus 3 equals 5 as self-evident, and that is because of presupposition 3b. The more evidence we have for a belief, the more justified we are in believing it. Most of us have been trained in basic arithmetic starting at a young age, and our beliefs about basic arithmetic are reinforced by confirmatory evidence throughout our entire lives as we build and verify arithmetic beliefs. Due to the colossal mountain of evidence that we unconsciously use to support it, the evidential argument for 2 plus 3 equals 5 is so strong that it seems self-evident. But in reality, when we think that, we may be unconsciously making an evidential evaluation of that proposition. The place of evidence in justifying abstract mathematical propositions becomes even more clear as the mathematics becomes more complicated. How do you verify your understanding of a basic principle of algebra? How do you verify that you understand integration by parts? How do you verify that the internal angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees? by working out the problem on paper and possibly verifying your answers through a computer, calculator, or textbook, all of which constitute a form of visual evidence. Evidence is essential to the verification process of even the most abstract and seemingly purely rational principles. And when we separate those rational activities too far from evidential verification, we are prone to make mistaken conclusions that are inconsistent with reality such as when we try to do too much of a math problem in our head, using the limited cognition available to render visual images in our mind. The primacy of evidence in justifying my beliefs only becomes more concrete as I begin to reason about the physical world. How do I know what grass looks like? How do I know what concrete sounds like when it breaks? How do I know what a pillow feels like? Because of the sensory memories I use as evidence for these properties, and if I ever doubt the conclusions I've made based on these memories, I can always go back and re-experience the evidence for each of them, which is the evidential verification process. This even applies to more complex physical properties. 
Descartes uses the example of wax as an example of something whose properties we could only know about through our mind and not through our senses. He references a piece of wax he is holding that was freshly taken from a beehive. He points out that it smells like flowers, has a solid form, and it makes noise when struck. Yet when he throws it in the fireplace, it melts. It no longer smells like flowers. It is no longer solid. And it would only burn his fingers, not make noise, if struck. Descartes argues that wax has none of the same properties it had before, and yet he still knows it is wax. And so, Descartes argues, it is only through his mind and not through his physical senses that he perceives wax. Yet again, I believe Descartes is unconsciously ignoring the physical evidence he used to come to those conclusions. If Descartes, as a child who had never before seen wax, happened upon both a honeycomb and a melting blob of wax in a fireplace, I very much doubt he would conclude that they were made of the same substance. It is only through the accumulation of physical sensory evidence that Descartes had gathered through the very experience of throwing honeycombs into fires that Descartes could justify his belief that honeycombs turn into melting blobs of wax. Everything we believe about wax and the different forms it can take is justified by the accumulation of physical evidence through physical experience. What about more complicated and difficult to perceive physical phenomena, like wind or radiation? For wind, even though we can't see it, we can feel it, and we can even see the things that it affects. Also, we can measure it through physical devices like anemometers. Physical devices like Geiger counters are particularly relevant to our measurement of radiation, since we can't necessarily feel it. The topic of radiation itself presents an important change in the gradation of the strength of my beliefs. While I have colossal mountains of personal experience to use as evidence for the principles of basic arithmetic and the existence of grass, pillows, and wind, I have not personally, consciously experienced radiation. In fact, how is it that I am aware of the possible existence of radiation at all? This introduces another important set of presuppositions, which can themselves be justified by evidence. It would be infeasible for me to try to personally collect all the evidence I use for my beliefs. I can gather new types of evidence in the form of multimedia, writings, and testimonies given by other people. Because I am not personally experiencing the direct physical evidence that these multimedia writings and testimonies represent, I cannot place as much confidence in them as I can in direct physical evidence. With the introduction of these new types of evidence, the world of my evidential reasoning both explodes with new possibilities and becomes more complicated and epistemologically dangerous. If I want to maximize my confidence in a belief, I should only use indirect evidence given to me by other people as a starting point and then directly verify the physical evidence myself. If I refuse to do this for any belief, I must accept that my confidence in it should be lower than my confidence in a belief based on physical evidence that I have directly verified. Why is it that I'm so skeptical of the conclusions of other people? Why do I place such greater confidence in evidence that I can verify directly? The reason is because of limitations that I recognize in myself. I have frequently and consistently misperceived the details of the physical world. For example, I have frequently misread emails, articles, or comments, only to return to them later and realize my mistaken perception. I have frequently and consistently misremembered what were possibly originally correct perceptions. For example, I have frequently misremembered quotes or physical details of scenes from movies I watched as a child, only to return to them later and realize they weren't as I remembered them. And finally, I have frequently and consistently miscommunicated what were possibly originally correct memories. For example, when explaining algorithms to students in the lab I teach, I sometimes accidentally leave out important details due to the mental resources consumed by the process of explaining. Even in the process of writing the transcript for this video, I've noticed that my ability to explain has improved after allowing myself a night of sleep to free up cognitive resources. As a result, 
Whenever I receive testimonial evidence from other human beings, I am at risk at all times of receiving a miscommunication of a misremembered misperception. During the process of telling a story or giving a detailed multi-phase explanation, another human being may make multiple errors on all of these different levels. The complication becomes even worse if that human being is depending on a story or multi-phase explanation provided by another human being, and so on. I later discovered cognitive psychology research demonstrating just how common these errors are among human beings, and just how unaware we are that we are routinely making these mistakes every day. The fact that we are unaware of these cognitive mistakes is pivotal to how they are propagated. It means that even when we feel we are being completely honest, and feel that we are being completely coherent, we can still miscommunicate, misremember, and misperceive, and possibly never realize we made the mistake. For example, as you are watching this video, it is very likely that you have missed some details about it. For example, because at least some of its content is probably thought-provoking to you, it's likely that sometimes your brain has launched involuntarily into your own personal thoughts, whether you wanted it to or not. When your brain does that, it consumes cognitive resources that you were previously using for attention and perception. And due to the detailed nature of this discussion, it's likely that you either did not perceive or misperceive some details. If you ever go back and watch this video again, it's likely that you will discover that you missed at least some details in the video that you had no memory of after the first viewing. If this is your first time watching the video, you will likely have this experience even if you feel very confident that you have been following me precisely. I've caught myself experiencing these holes in perception when watching nature documentaries, listening to audiobooks, and even when reading Descartes. It's only because I can rewind these media forms that I can become aware of the details I've missed. Imagine the missing details we could discover if we could rewind our experience of reality. Most of the time, we conduct our lives almost completely oblivious of these misperceptions. Our brains are very adept at filling in holes in our misperceptions to build a story that is so coherent that we rarely recognize the holes are even there which, for the sake of smooth cognitive functioning, is probably a good thing. But it is important for us to be aware of these cognitive weaknesses. And recognizing their existence demonstrates the inherent superiority of experiencing direct evidence in comparison to relying on our own memories and the memories of other people. After years of learning and developing my skills at applying these basic principles of evidence-based reasoning, I was in a better position to evaluate the use of more advanced evidential principles such as Occam's razor, as well as examine the relevance of these principles to some of the more contentious claims made in human society throughout human history, especially concerning the existence of God.